In this episode of Cycling Tours, I will explore the cycling network within the western sector of Jurong Lake. Hey everybody, Transit Evolution here, and welcome back to yet another episode featuring a cycling town with a slightly older network, Jurong Lake which I shall cover over two extremely lengthy videos. This video covering the western sector starts at Chinese Gardens and ends at Lakeside MRT Station, and will begin on some narrow and overcrowded paths with poor segregation along Boon Lay Way. Just to be clear, I'm covering the cycling paths used for commuting within Jurong Lake Cycling Town, not the recreational paths within Jurong Lake Gardens further south, which I'm sure many cycling YouTubers will have done already. It means that paradoxically, you will see very little of Jurong Lake in both videos. Even more confusingly, the cycling town here also goes by the name of Jurong Lake District in many publications, even though that commonly refers to the area south of Jurong East MRT Station, deemed as Singapore's second central business district, which hasn't quite taken shape yet. Let's just say that Jurong Lake Cycling Town is an arbitrary concept used by the Land Transport Authority and comprises of the entirety of Jurong East New Town and neighbourhoods 4 and 5 of Jurong West New Town. Travelling along the southern side of Boon Lay Way, you can sense that the paths, over half a decade old at this point, are starting to show their age, with paint fading away and the surface cracking apart. This raises concerns about how our newer cycling paths will age years from now unless regular repainting is done. The path is also not very continuous and ends briefly, as I head onto a narrow footpath along a bridge across Jurong Canal, making for fairly dangerous travel very close to fast and busy traffic along Boon Lay Way. It's a big enough concern that it made it into a forum letter to today. This problem will be mitigated shortly though, when a new bridge for pedestrians and cyclists opens further south, linking the recently opened section of the Lakeside Gardens and the new Chinese Gardens. Meanwhile, I entered a 700 meter long boardwalk completed in 2021, serving as a park connector with a shared path design, enabling a more comfortable walk or ride compared to the footpath, away from the busy Boon Lay Way. The path was built within the railway protection zone of the East West Line MRT Viaduct, enhancing connectivity between Chinese Gardens and Lakeside MRT stations, between a steep slope and a roadside drain. It's worth noting that there's another park connector running through Lakeside Gardens further on my left. It's good to have some path duplication here, as it enables separation of functions between the two paths. Those who want to cycle recreationally would use the path left of me, while those cycling as a means of commute will use this more direct path. Now, I approach the intersection with Jurong West Street 51 and Yuan Ching Road. Being next to Lakeside MRT Station, this intersection sees a lot of pedestrians and cyclists. Unfortunately, it's motorists who are prioritised here, you know, to keep the traffic moving. All slip lanes here are controlled by traffic lights, so crossing this intersection diagonally involves crossing four separate signalised crossings, spanning up to 17 lanes of vehicular traffic. A fairly frustrating process, which will take me two and a half minutes as a cyclist on this weekend afternoon, due to the long cycle times required to give pedestrians the time needed to cross these wide roads at one go. Just to put things into perspective, this is half the time it took for me to cycle at a leisurely pace from Chinese Garden to Lakeside MRT Station. If the signal progression had been done to follow the pace of walk-cycle-ride modes instead of vehicular traffic, cycling would have been a lot more time competitive as a means of transport here. But since it isn't, I find myself delayed here, which will affect my average speed and slow commutes down. This is the reason I'm not speeding up the video here, so that viewers can have an accurate picture of delays that lengthen a cycling commute. I shall now head into the midst of the housing neighbourhoods. Just to recap, this video will cover the western sector of Jurong Lake Cycling Town, namely Jurong East Neighbourhood 3, forming the Yuihua West Subzone, and Jurong West Neighbourhoods 4 and 5, together forming the Hong Ka Subzone. I'll start by traversing the cycling paths along the small streets of Hong Ka, then travel along Jurong West and Jurong East Avenue 1, the main east-west axis within the neighbourhood, before going on the cycling paths within Yuihua West. Let's begin with the shared path on the western side of Jurong West Street 51. The shared path here isn't exactly the best design. They are very close to the road, and sometimes there are obstacles in the way. 
However, the main problem with the shared path here is that it is not continuous. Just as a reminder, shared paths are demarcated by dotted red lines on both edges of the pavement. Where the dotted line ends, the shared path turns into a footpath, with the paint demarcating shared paths cracking or fading away along some sections, the difference between a footpath and a shared path muddles. While this is not a problem for people on acoustic bicycles, which can legally be ridden on footpaths, those on power-assisted bikes and personal mobility devices are legally obligated to dismount and push when traversing such sections. Usually, this is already pretty inconvenient. But letting markings crack away in this repair risk making all PAB and PMD riders here lawbreakers, even if they are trying to ride responsibly because it is now impossible to distinguish them. Ideally, the whole path should either be a shared path or not at all. Just want to note at this informal crossing that at many such crossings around neighborhood centers, you can claim priority for motorists by cycling onto a zebra crossing along the corridor with shops further to my left instead of waiting for motor vehicles to pass if the vehicular queue is long. But that may not always be feasible, as the paths leading to it are really narrow. I'll briefly skip this part of Jurong West Avenue 1, we'll look at it later. In the meantime, let's head on to Jurong West Street 42. I'm now on this street separating Jurong West Neighbourhood 5 on my left, from neighborhood 4 on my right. As I travel along, let's take the time to appreciate the thought given in the urban planning of Jurong East and Jurong West new towns, constructed in the early 1980s under the fifth five-year building program. For context, back in the 1980s, the housing board was no longer just striving for better flat and block designs, but a more visually exciting environment, using urban design and street architecture to create precincts, neighborhoods, and towns with individual identity. In the case of Jurong, the street layouts here took advantage of the gently rolling queues and the lake and gardens to the south, resulting in curvilinear streets like the one I'm travelling on, as opposed to the more grid iron ones in Tampanese. Another way is the use of reserved sites. Here, there's a significantly newer housing precinct to the left, Spring Heaven at Jurong. This is a development made possible by the presence of reserved sites in the original new town plan. Given the passage of time, Building forms would change and look very different, adding diversity to the skyline here. But most of these sites are much smaller, interspersed with housing blocks, meant to be used for special buildings to be filled over time. Also worth noting is the more liberal use of low-rise buildings within precincts. This may not be directly apparent given the 10-storey tall blocks, like block 433 to my right. But further in, there are plenty of 4-storey blocks, like block 434, which helps to achieve a more human scale. The mixing of building heights within precincts creates a variety of interesting spaces. Another way to achieve character amongst individual streets is changing the pattern of building forms. Here, they come in orderly, repetitive clusters of mid-rise buildings, somewhat aligned to both sides of the street, which provide a casual enclosure, and hence a sense of place. Placing the blocks in a rhythmic manner also creates a distinctive skyline for motorists driving along the Penn Island Expressway to the north. One block up ahead looks a bit shorter, 418 Jurong West Street 42. While low blocks are usually nestled within precincts, they are sometimes also built fronting the streetscape. This adds layer and depth to the streetscape, but more importantly, shields the large number of units exposed to traffic noise within the high buildings, thus helping to make the living environment quieter for more people. Here, I approach the neighbourhood centre of Jurong West Neighbourhood 4. This neighbourhood centre in particular was singled out by the housing board, which mentioned that it was designed with Chinese architectural influence, given how close it is to Chinese gardens. Moving further along, we will continue to see the checkerboard pattern being applied throughout this neighbourhood, as high-density housing precincts like Jurong View at Street 41 to my right regularly alternate with open spaces, parks and playgrounds, neighbourhood centres, and schools, such as Fuhua Secondary to my left, which are all low-rise in nature. So far, I've not been talking about the cycling network within this neighbourhood. Here's some construction trivia. 
The grey cycling paths here were mainly constructed under contract TR128, which was awarded in 2015, spanning 15 kilometers, and completed in 2017. This makes this cycling town the last one in Singapore to be built with grey cycling paths. The cycling town before, Ang Mokyo, and the one after, Bedok, uses a red design, with treatments that more seriously accommodate the bicycle. The approach taken along the small streets is mainly an older design with grey cycling paths further from the road than the footpath. You will notice the presence of many speed regulating strips along the way, accompanied by give way to pedestrians signs every single time the cycling path intersects with a footpath leading into housing precincts. Occasionally, the two path merges into a shared path and then splits again after a while. So although the main carriageway is rather smooth with few interruptions, the cycling path has many, and as a result of the poor designs here, nobody is following any of the signages, as it doesn't work well for them. Major road junctions like the one up ahead are treated as focal points and are intentionally designed to look distinctive and different. From my perspective, you will soon see a function hall as part of Hong Ka Point, Jurong West Neighborhood 5's center. From the other side, you will see Jurong West United Temple, directly next to me on the right, right now. Now, I'm on Jurong West Street 52, the second silver zone ever built in Singapore, built in 2015, a year after the one in Bukit Merah View. Plenty of traffic calming measures were done in the process. Road lanes were narrowed, a central divider with mountable curbs was added, and the added road space was repurposed to build the shared path I'm travelling on right now. The pavement is not very good in quality, and it places active mobility users travelling in the opposite direction a little too close for comfort to motor traffic, but it works, so long you aren't rushing on it. I'm passing 526 Jurong West Street 52 the shortest block yet with two storeys. But you can't see it, because there are earth mounds and trees to my left blocking the view. They are meant to buffer the residential environment from traffic noise. Though given the low speed and volume of traffic here, there aren't many noise pollution issues along the street. What a tranquil and blissful place, where to find amongst newer towns today. Speaking of speed, unlike most silver zones, this one has a speed limit of 30 km per hour. Together with the one in Bukit Merah View, their speed limits were lowered from 40 to 30 as part of a trial in 2020 and made permanent in 2021. It may just be a difference of 10 km per hour, but it greatly improves the safety of seniors here, as the energy dissipated in the event of a collision between a vehicle and a pedestrian is reduced by 45%. That's just how physics works. With the traversal of the small streets within Jurong West neighborhoods 4 and 5 done, I will now apply the east-west axis holding these neighbourhoods together, Jurong West and East Avenue 1. Although there are no MRT stations on either end, I will set a timer at the next bus stop just to see how long it takes to get from the western end of Jurong West neighbourhood 5 to the eastern end of Jurong East neighbourhood 3. It's worth noting that many bus services with very different functions do apply the entire length of the same stretch of roadway. 99, 157, 185, and 198. That's not considering Express 502 and City Direct 657, which even go all the way to the eastern end of Toguan Road. But let's just consider this stretch of roadway today. Taking the bus over 7 stops takes 11 minutes excluding wait times, while driving takes 7 minutes, excluding the time spent finding a parking lot. Make a guess, how long would cycling take?
along this minor arterial road, you will notice quite a significant number of pedestrians along the way, making for a rather lively place. Unlike some newer estates, the street life is very strong here. There are many reasons for this. For one, there is the presence of not one, not two, but four neighbourhood centres within 2.5 kilometres along the same corridor, assembling people onto this corridor rather than dispersing them throughout town. This makes it easy for them to be on the way to transit connections, which explains why there is a variety of frequent bus services here. Even though the population density here is fairly low, given the larger size of the housing flats here and the number of four-storey blocks, something that has completely vanished in newer neighbourhoods like Neighbourhood 6, Pioneer to the west. Even if you don't take the bus, the neighbourhood centres are less than 900 metres apart from each other, as is typical of most new towns in Singapore. This means that most residents here are living within 400 metres from a large traditional neighbourhood centre, or a 5-minute walk from the majority of amenities which they need, making a walk useful. Unlike most new estates though, the walk here is more comfortable, given the presence of big trees with sprawling canopies providing shade. The careful attention to detail to create a better spatial and street environment town-wide makes the walk more interesting. And the main true fare, a four-lane minor arterial, is fairly easy to cross. The fact that a significant stretch of it has been converted into a 40 km per hour silver zone should us help make the walk safer as well. Still, there are many issues with the path here where it comes to using it for active mobility. You can already tell that a shared path is frequently interrupted by intersecting pedestrian pathways and vehicular driveways, or places where you have to give way. That will slow you very much. Another problem is that bus stop bypasses, if they exist, are fairly questionable in design. They have sharp corners, so many riders will opt to pass through the bus stop itself, as it is easier to do so, which disrupts commuters waiting for the bus, or alighting and boarding. Aside from that, the pavement quality is not good, with many seams along the way. Not so much a problem for shared bike riders like me with thicker and bigger wheels, but for motorised PMD and PAB riders on devices with smaller wheels to meet the weight limit requirements, they are all potential tripping hazards. I'm about to cross the Jurong Canal on a bridge where I leave Jurong West Neighbourhood 4 and enter Jurong East Neighbourhood 3. Jurong Park Connector intersects this road here and I will get to it later. Being built at about the same time with similar planning concepts, the walkability here is pretty good, just like in the neighbourhood further west. If you disregard the crumbling state of the paths, that is. While it is pleasant to cycle under the shade of trees, I have plenty of trust issues with the path here. As I approach Blue Cross Tong King home, the dotted red markings demarcating the shed path abruptly disappear. Once again, not a problem for cyclists. Footpath cycling is legal in Singapore. But it practically means every motorised PMD or PAB rider who does not dismount and push committed an offence there. It's worth noting that this path segment, along with many others along Jurong East Avenue 1, is supposed to form a continuous cycling route that spans the entire length of the town. That was the expectation when the plans were announced in 2015, but the reality is discontinuous.
I made a brief stop here as I saw the shed path marking abruptly leading me to the traffic light and nearly thought it was time to cross to the other side. Good thing I didn't, because the marking is a misleading guide. The cycling infrastructure continues further along. As I said, I'm having trust issues. Anyway, I'm now passing Yuhua Place, Zhuang East Neighborhood Trees Center. The signalized crossing is very popular amongst the residents here. This is where the cycling path finally switches position to the opposite side of this road. If you are not familiar with this place, it will be easy to make four starts and cross to the other side way ahead of time. Another thing to note is that many shed paths in this town are not buffered from the motor traffic directly to my right. The requirement nowadays is to have at least a 60cm buffer from the curb. Without the buffer, people in the opposite direction just have to make one mistake and they will find themselves on the road, against the flow of traffic, which could lead to a terrible accident. It also makes informal crossings very far out and close to the main roadway. Couple that with the corner radiuses required for vehicles to make their turn, and you find yourself crossing longer distances unprotected from motor vehicles. Traffic volumes aren't exactly low here either, so you will see me spend long times waiting at traffic lights and giving way to vehicles turning into the car park. Such wait times add up, resulting in a 19 minutes journey along this 2.5 km stretch by bike, which is really slow. This is nearly twice the duration by bus and thrice off car. In the meantime, I've reached Jurong Town Hall Road on a newer cycling path built to the west side of it. The positioning of this path is strange, being further from the roadway than the covered walkway. But this is an arrangement that is used at times so that the covered walkway, which came not too long before the cycling path, does not have to be demolished and rebuilt again. They also had to route the cycling path behind this pedestrian overhead bridge. After all, it's always easier to encroach into state land than to take one lane from motor vehicles. This cycling path abruptly ends at Bukit Batok flyover, where Jurong Town Hall Road widens to 15 lanes to meet the Pan Island Expressway. In the future, it will connect to the so-called Car Light Tengah New Town. <laughs> Alright, enough rambling about cycling infrastructure, as I shall now head back to Jurong East Street 32. Much of what you see here will be similar to Jurong West neighbourhoods 4 and 5, although some of the blocks here feature pitched roofs. The main defining detail of housing blocks in Jurong East though, is the use of split, chamfered corners, such as in the original leaf shaft which came with the housing blocks. It's a very subtle detail that isn't well known, but once you know about it, you will see it everywhere.
Moving along Jurong East Street 31, it is worth noting that while the neighbourhood centres are often the visual focus of the neighbourhood, this particular neighbourhood centre, Yuhua Place, has a pedestrian mall that is aligned with a vista towards the pagoda at Chinese Gardens. Before the trees here matured and the east-west MRT line viaduct was built, you quite literally have a view of the pagoda right in front of us. It's impressive how such minute details are intentionally considered as well. Anyway, I shall now move to the Jurong Park connector. Gonna wait by the side of the intersection, since the traffic island accommodating the sleep lane is way too small to accommodate the pedestrians and cyclists here. One thing I did different for this video compared to previous cycling tours is to speed up the part of the footage where I wait at traffic lights between two discontinuous cycling paths, so as not to bore you and needlessly extend the duration of this video. Even at 20 times the real time speed, the time spent waiting for the traffic lights to cross Boon Lake Way in two stages is fairly noticeable. For residents who cycle on the Jurong Canal stretch of the Jurong Park connector for their intra-town commuting, such delays add significant travel times. Now, it is worth noting that a Jurong Canal Drive extension, perhaps on the opposite side of this canal, has been proposed to be a bus-only transit priority corridor sometime back in 2019 under the draft master plan then, and the land transport master plan 2040. As of today, it is still that, a plan. Meanwhile, across Avenue 1, more concrete plans have been implemented. I'll tell you when we get there, across yet another mildly inconvenient two-stage crossing. You can see a bit of construction work going on here, I suppose to enhance the park connector. After all, this stretch of Jurong Park connector will eventually form a part of the Round Island route. However, there are other roadworks in the vicinity as well, such as a new flyover providing connections for motorists between Tenga, Jurong East and West and the Penn Island Expressway. Works are ongoing right now. As for the bus corridor, where? I don't know. The park connector abruptly ends here. Plans call for it to travel parallel to the PIE as a continuation of the Round Island route. But for this video, this is as far as I will go. I shall now head to the very last stretch of cycling paths to be traversed in this video. This one is a little special because it is not parallel to any other roads. It is a nameless true block link to provide more direct access for pedestrians and cyclists to Lakeside MRT Station. To 
to legitimize this linkage for non-motorists, I'll give it the name Lakeshore Link for this video. It's critical to have such links, as they pass through developments that are non-porous, unlike public housing. This is because the Lakeshore condo on my left and two schools, Yuhua Secondary and Shu Chin Primary to my right, have access control. Linkages like this are not as essential in public housing estates, but it will still be great to see them built more often to increase the permeability of the estate and hence connectivity for those walking and cycling. Lakeshore Link links me from Jurong West Street 41 to 51, and at this point, I'm very close to Lakeside MRT Station. I just have to cross this humongous intersection, which I have passed through earlier and previously critiqued in my video on the cycling network of Taman Jurong. Once again, bear with me for a moment as I cross diagonally over four sets of traffic lights. Overall, I would say that the cycling network in the western sector of Jurong Lake leaves much to be desired. While the surrounding environment is very conducive to walking and cycling, with its lush greenery and thoughtful spatial design, the cycling paths themselves are pretty laughable. After just half a decade of use, some parts of the pain have cracked beyond recognition, while the unevenness along the pavement could be dangerous for motorized active mobility device riders. It is probably about time for a fresh coat of paint, hopefully using more durable materials this time, at least to bring the cycling paths here to a higher standard, like Taman Jurong to the south. Better geometric design of paths that takes the needs of pedestrians and AM riders more seriously are also very much welcomed. As I approach Lakeside MRT Station, it is slowly becoming obvious that I'm coming to the end of this episode of Cycling Tours. Do leave your thoughts on Jurong Lake's cycling network in the comment section below. Feel free to support me using the memberships or super thanks function of YouTube as well. This is Transit Evolution, signing off.